Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Command Show. We have a special guest tonight. Uh, David Rhodes, the editor-in-chief of Fire Engineering, is joining myself and Brian Brush. Uh, you'll notice we have a new format here, which we're excited about. And um, we're going to talk about Incident Command like we always do, but we're going to talk about the planned event, which is a little different than, uh, than what we normally talk about. Before we do, though, we'd like to start every show with just reviewing the NIOSH 5. And remember, these are not just line-of-duty death issues. These can be also um, near-miss issues, significant career-ending injuries. Um, if you just have a sloppy fire ground operations, the more of these that are in alignment, the more likely your fire ground is going to go sideways. And if you have all five of them, you might have a sentinel event. So number one is risk management, um, in, 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 uh, effective or inadequate risk assessment, I should say. So that's just size up, you know, not not knowing what you're dealing with. Um, if you read any NIOSH report, it's going to say once upon a time there was a fire department, they went to a fire, they didn't know what they had, bad things happened. So that's number one is risk assessment, um, which includes anything from collapse potential to uh, hostile fire events to uh, not knowing that you're going to fall into a basement. Uh, number two is communications. We all know that's one of the number one things in the fire ground every time. It doesn't have to be a line of duty death or even a near miss. Uh, number three is accountability, lack of or improper accountability, not knowing where everyone is, what they're doing. Uh, number four is inadequate incident command, which is what this show and the training that we do is all about, about robust incident command, proactive decentralized incident command. And finally is uh, lack of SOGs or not following your SOGs. That could be PPE. It could be uh, operational. Um, so if, if one or two of those are in, in play, chances are uh, your fire ground's getting a little sideways. If you have four or five, you could have a sentinel event. Uh, the role of the tactical supervisor, as we talk about in our training, is to prevent the NASH 5 from coming into alignment. So that's why I like to review every show. Start it with, with the NASH 5 review. So with that, we're going to talk about the planned event. And there is no bigger planned event probably in the American Fire Service than FDIC. Uh, we just concluded 23. And Chief Rhodes uh, has been intimately involved with FDIC for uh, many, many years, probably what, 25 years at least? It's 98. Yeah, I can't do that. That's 25 years, I guess. <laughs> so, um, but he's been behind the scenes a lot with logistics and um, he was the IC this year and uh, did an amazing job. We, we were uh, happy and proud to see him up there. And uh, it's a lot uh, to bear. A lot takes a lot of planning. And so we wanted to look at ICS from an, a planned event because you can take it because you have discretionary time. When you have a, a planned event, there's a lot of time to get ahead of it. This is something that you're like, literally uh, you just told this chief that you're planning FDIC 24 right now. So you're just shy of a year out. So this gives you a lot of time to really get into the details of what's going to happen and how things are interconnected, which you don't have that kind of discretionary time on a structure fire, but the lessons are the same. So with that, thank you for joining us tonight. Yes, sir. Wouldn't have missed it. Love talking this stuff. So, Chief, I kind of, uh, you know, thinking about FDIC and, and you know, I, I knew your role as, as logistics and supporting the hot events and those types of things. Um, but, I mean, now, you know, you are transitioning into that role of, of truly the, the IC of it. And, you know, back to your article about being prepared for that next step. Uh, I guess I just kind of uh, hit me that, you know, taking advantage of these planned events uh, might be kind of an underutilized tool in the fire service. I know, you know, we have a an air show coming up uh, here pretty soon in, in our area, uh, joint with the, the Air Force Base. And uh, we certainly tabletop scenarios and those types of things. But not, there's really nothing like getting to exercise these uh, functions of command uh, in a, in an actual environment with actual things going on. So, you know, given your experience both in the fire service and with managing FDIC from logistics and now command, uh, do you feel like we're missing opportunities to, to take advantage of planned events for incident command systems? Absolutely. And what usually ends up happening in most organizations is they'll, they'll have a special events group or something in the department, especially in the urban departments. And the operational folks won't really be involved in it that much. It'll sort of be the, the planned, uh, the, the special events group 
at headquarters or whatever that'll that'll put it together and maybe operations involvement in it would only be staffing the units that was that were there so um i actually learned incident command very early um 1985 86 and that was um that was not a genie coming out of a bottle. I think that was brushes ring doorbell. Um, but I, uh, I learned it from a mentor of mine managing the fire department Halloween festivities. And he drew it out on a piece of paper, showed me like, okay, who was, who was in charge of each of the carnival events and who was in charge of resupply and each station and all that. And it really made sense. And, uh, I've applied it to everything from Georgia smoke divers um, all the way through. And then of course, FDIC being the biggest, um, biggest event. And uh, I think that it should be mandatory that anybody, especially at the battalion chief and above level be at least a type three um, incident commander and at least one other um, function like, plans or logistics or one of those so that when you do have um a tornado come through or a flood or anything like that your own duty crew can come together and make up uh, a quick type three team to get things going and as you guys you know clearly know there is a huge difference when you move from that four five to three and this is going to be a sustained uh, incident and operation and the place that you can really practice and learn that's planned events, uh, whether it's a road race, an air show, um, a festival and all of the functions pretty much that you need on an incident are there. Uh, one of the, one of the things that, uh, we were able to do with smoke divers is we took like verbatim, the pure NIMS forms and we customized them to meet our planned event. Um, and I think there's a, there's purist out there that, you know, they don't want you to touch any of the forms, but we totally redesigned the forms, but they still have their same intent and they still have their same number. So it matches, but we have it where we can fill in the blanks of what we need versus, you know, a wildfire. We don't need a helicopter manager or or air manager or what have you but we still have those boxes and we've just moved them around to fit you know our our system and when you do that your planned event's going to be be the same i mean the 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 best natural disaster that is already pre-planned is a flood it floods in the same place every time maybe a little higher maybe a little lower um so you could build you, you your your flood plan and, and your maps and i'll tell you exactly where your problems are going to be you can pre-plan that as a planned event and and be ready to roll but uh absolutely to answer your question we do miss out on a lot of opportunities but i do think that there are departments that uh do capitalize on it and and get their their eoc involved they get their um uh multi-agency coordination goes on especially like a super bowl or something like that so a lot of it is going on but there is missed opportunities too so with that would you be willing to kind of uh, i mean i guess we kind of started off but uh to give people the the size and scope of F fdic i mean i i know in speaking with you you kind of had had said that most of the kind of operational plan is is centered around the hot events and those types of things but i mean just overall how many people are we talking how many sites are we talking um so, so we can start with the the scope of of the management and, and command structure of fdic All right well if you think it's uh if you think it's crazy merging EOC and command and all the functions and the confusion that happens and who's in charge of what, who's support and who's operations. And I'll combine that with corporate America. <laughs> in corporate America, um, if you look at like for the show, um, on the show side, which would be the facilities, Lucas Oil, the, the ICC, the rooms, all of that stuff that is actually event operations. 
All right. But right. everything they do falls under the definition of logistics in our emergency world. So basically everything in a planned event is logistics until the event actually occurs. And so it's kind of hard to wrap your, your ha head around some of the terminology, but it's definitely nothing that we haven't seen before with working in multi-agencies. So, so yes, as far as the traditional, what we would see fire service incident command, um, we have a full local staff that staffs like a type three team. And I would say the logistics side probably gets very, very well into type two numbers. Um, that's the only section that really branches out that big, but the operation up until the day of is pretty much all, all planning and logistics. So we had this year, um, a little over 34,000 people attended the FDIC, um, that were there over the course of seven days, counting the instructor days and set up. So we had 20 hot classes at 12 sites, but that's kind of a misnomer. So we sell ourselves short by just saying 20 hot classes because that actually entailed 66 hot sessions because some of those are four hour classes and they're doing two classes a day, even though it's the same title, it's 66 actual sessions during those 66 se sessions. We had over 3,300 students, um, come through that. So they have, uh, they have to be gathered, um, early enough to catch the bus, to make it to their site. One site, uh, this year and has been the last couple of years was the Illinois fire service Institute. So they had uh, almost a two hour, two hour bus ride. So obviously you got to coordinate that that bus needs to be the first one loaded. It needs to be first in line and the first one to leave. So, uh, there was also at the same time, 50, there was 56 workshops over two days with, uh, over 3,100 students. And, uh, and those are going on in the, in the convention center at the same time. So in order to make hot work, there's, uh, the full planning team that's working almost year round. Uh, I, when I say there's full-time staff working year round, but the local planning team, which is Indy firefighters and township firefighters and, and officers that come together to make our team. We do have an incident commander just for that, um, which is Indy's Homeland Security uh, and Emergency Manager, which is a battalion chief for Indy. And uh, he was our former plans chief and then moved up in progression. And then he has a full staff. He has a planning chief and a safety officer. And, uh, and we're in communication all year round but they actually build the IEP, which I believe this year's, uh, since we were, we were in the 20 class range was somewhere in the neighborhood of 65, 70 pages, um, for the IEP. And that's because of your, um, all of your individual site documentation and who's working at the sites and all that. So gets into a lot of stuff. And then we have, you know, heat, uh, we have the medical parameters and safety and all that is all built, built in. So the largest section being logistics, um, obviously we have a logistics chief, we have a transportation officer, communications officer, we have a facilities unit. Um, and then we have some positions that it's like, again, it's out of the box. We can make it fit somewhere, but we just sort of put them where, where we need them. So we have a guy that's local and one of his jobs is he helps to find sites. He coordinates all the dumpsters, all the porta potties. He gets all the pallets. He gets any ground ladders that aren't attached to an apparatus. He gets all the straw and hay and all. And, and that's his domain, him and another guy, they do that. Well, where do you put him on the, the chart? So we just plug him in as another position. You know, he's like a unit leader and, uh, 
Um, you're not going to find that in the, in the book as, you know, he's part supply, but he's part management and he's, you know, he's a little bit of that. And I, the point I want to make is it's okay. It's yeah. okay. You're purist. Let it go. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. Yeah, it's don't, a don't have a system. seizure. It yeah. is a system to manage the incident. And, you know, on, on a, on a wildland fire, there would be very specific duties for each person and all that. But a lot of our people are multitasking and, uh, they're doing, you know, multiple things. So we make sure they're documented in the system and they know what they're doing. So then let's go on down the line, uh, for the instru oh, we also have a supply unit leader who does all the ordering and he's a local person, Ted Moore, who, um, purchases things he manages the accounts you know at all the the home depots and the steel um supply and and all of that and then we have a cash manager which is uh your old buddy ron from Ronnie sacramento Pierce. still hanging yeah. in there he's yeah. still on he's still on two or three imts out there in california yeah. does, still he still, in. does he still wear his butt buckle on the side of his pants yes I know, I never and his badge that. and his name tag and everything else to make sure yeah. you know who who he is still, um, still hanging in there, still hanging in there, doing a phenomenal job of managing that warehouse, knowing where everything is. So then we'll have four or five, what we call class specialists, which under the, the true term would be like a logistician. Um, so one class specialist will be the contact between the lead instructor um, for like five classes. That's about the span of control for the amount of equipment that they can manage somewhere around four or five classes. And we scale up and we, you know, we back off based on however many classes we pick. Then we have to get to the, the 12 sites. We've got 16 drivers driving flatbeds, pickups, vans, whatever it is we need to drive about 10 additional helpers. We have about 30 recruits working at the warehouse. And then every site, the best way to describe the, the management system, this is where it gets really big, is I guess in the NIMS world, it would be called a camp manager, um, but we call it a site supervisor. And that's one person that is in charge of that site. And they're our contact. So again, that is the operation really, but they're reporting back to command and letting them know when the buses arrive, letting them know when the buses leave. And then the instructors go to that person during class hours if they need anything. So let's say they're running low on fuel for a generator that they need. They need some more fuel after lunch. They'll, they don't have to stop and call us. They go to the site supervisor. They tell the site supervisor, the site supervisor radios it to logistics. And of course, you know, you got your lag time when you're scattered, out one class, not counting the, the Illinois fire service Institute, which that one is self-sufficient because they're at an Academy and they, they do everything their self there. But like Champo's class was almost an hour out of downtown. And so you have to, you know, you have to account for that. We have had some forward logistics a few times where we were out an hour plus with two or three classes. And so we would stage a crew, out there with purchasing power and and all that to get things in a timely manner so each site that was 20 sites has a site supervisor and then each class has a safety officer um on that site and live fire classes have multiple safety officers so when you when you put all the site supervisors the safety officers all the logistics people together there's over a hundred people working in that system to make hot work. Um, not counting the command staff back at the, at the convention center. So then you have your communications unit and they're handling conference communications and hot communications at the same time from the, from the convention center. We issue out about 200 radios and have to get those back. All of the vendor equipment comes in and is received in the warehouse. Um, we have stuff that we keep all year round, but we do receive stuff from the, um, from the exhibitors. So 
we receive 350 air packs. We receive um, about 100 thermal imagers and just various other stuff that has to be tracked, accounted for, distributed to the sites, collected back Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, and then delivered back to the convention center to the uh, to the owners of it for display or for use in their in their exhibit. So um, it's basically like an ant hill that gets kicked and it, and it starts going. But if you ever watch, you can see there's order to that ant hill after a few seconds. You know, yep. troops start lining up and things start happening. So um, it's huge. And then um, and on top of that, the operational part has we have medics that are out on cars. We have doctors that are in cars. So if anybody's hurt, there's a procedure to follow. And it's tight. It is very, very tight. Um, we know instantly when there's an injury, there's group pages that go across. It tells us what's happening. Usually it's heat exhaustion. Uh, somebody hit their thumb with an ax or, you know, maybe a minor cut. Luckily, we haven't had any major, major injuries. Um, the major injuries have happened after hours on scooters downtown. That's right. Um, but, um, <laughs> as far as our hot delivery, it's much safer than riding a scooter in Indianapolis after hours. That should be the so, slogan for FDIC. Yeah. Safer than riding a scooter. Luckily, um, the guy who was really hurt bad was discharged to rehab, uh, just a few days ago. So Jeez. he's, uh, he's doing better. So chief, when you, when, with your experience in this, not just, uh, as the IC, but all these years. How did that help you be a better battalion chief? Um, I think I learned more about resource management, um, doing logistics than, than anything else. And, and I was very fortunate that, um, we had large incidents in the city in Atlanta, um, parking deck collapse. I was always on the operational end though, but, um, as we developed a state IMT and I got involved with that, I did a little more natural disaster and USAR type work, but just the day to day, um, just the day to day, keeping the, the wheels turning and, and all that, it gives you a much better perspective of what it takes to actually run your organization. And that was one of my, uh, loyal disobedience, um, things is that I would always, uh, I would always bring up in the staff meetings at the appropriate time that everybody believed in the incident command system and it was mandated and it was in our SOPs and all. And I would always ask the question, I'm like, why don't we use it for our day to day, uh, operation? Like why exactly. is, why is this operations chief ordering supplies for these four items? But then there's a purchasing process over here but then the admin folks order their own over here and it was just like dysfunctional when you when you get a grasp on it so we, it we embrace it and mandate it but we don't use it all we don't time. use it and, and we don't use it on fires like we should and we don't use it day to day i, th I think you could organize any fire department using ics there's no you reason know, you can work. organize anything yeah. using ics i mean like i said a halloween carnival a freaking party all the elements are yep. there. All, all it is is a structure to get things done. Yeah, you just plug it in. And that, that's the thing is I think if, if departments did use it to run their departments, to literally their org chart look like an ICS chart, then yeah. it would embed that thinking in everything they do. So when an incident happened, it was just like, well, we just, staff we everything. meetings would be the planning P. <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah, so. exactly. So, yeah, they do a great job and I hats off. And, you know, you guys said like, I see, I guess, um, I am ultimately responsible, but I guess as, as we move forward, we're, we will probably restructure some terminology. And like I said, we're going to try to pull some of, some of the terminology in and, you know, teach what all the system can do on the, on the other side of the event, even though they're, they're doing fine. Um, managing that with very few people and stuff, but it makes sense to kind of have everything in alignment that, yeah. that works. Um, but it's, it is, it is definitely the key to any successful incident is that pre-incident planning and then having the resources to execute. 
um, same as anywhere else. Yeah. What would you say um, if for, you mentioned uh, EOC and corporate, right? So there's always that disparity out there on type three incident or type two or type one. Okay. What's the EOC's job and scope? What's, what's the command team's job and scope operationally and all that. And, um, and then there's there's unified command and all and there's you know all this stuff. How would you say FDIC is organized from a from that? Is it a unified command? Would you say is it mm-hmm. is it an EOC or a corporate is or is EOC and and everybody that we know is and 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 contend with or interact with all the time is uh, the operational side, the ICS side, or how would you describe it? Um, no, cause the pretty much the ICS side is strictly on the hands-on training side. As far as the actual structure, there are components that stay in place like the medical, um, the communications during the thing, but there's not a room where, you know, like the big boss is sitting in there. I'm not confined to that room. They're just handling business. So actually I kind of think that technically by the chart, I'm probably more the agency administrator uh, or, or a role like agency that. Agency rep. Yeah, agency rep. So, like, I'm, they're sort of they're running the incident for me, you know, um, and I'm, like, saying this is what we want to accomplish, and and then I'm kind of out of it, and but I get updates, but I'm not sitting there in the EOC. You know, I can't. I'm, I'm Yeah, well, you're, you're almost, you're almost like ops. You're kind of like ops now, you know. Yeah. Instead of the yeah, IC, anyway. but you're almost like ops, you know. Yeah, so um, – so yeah, once the hot is over, it really, the pace really slows down. There is still tons of demob and recovery going on on the logistics side. And those guys are checking sites and picking up equipment and we're moving equipment around too. So like, uh, for everybody that participates in the stair climb, like those packs have been on a hot site. Um, you know, they've been deconned and transported back to a warehouse and then, um, over to Lucas Oil Stadium to be used. They have, they have to be dropped off by our team. They don't magically appear, and they weren't there before the show. So um, they're used, and then they're packed back up, and then they're picked up and moved back, and then everything everything has to be accounted for and shipped back. So that is the most difficult piece. When you take all the individual pieces of equipment, saws, thermal imaging cameras, um, breathing apparatus and accounting for each one and making sure that if you are missing one, you know where to go look. And uh, if you don't have a system, you will not find it. But mm-hmm. we have been at, we have such a good system that we have literally lost. Um, we actually lost a saw one time and we found it two years later. <laughs> And we had the serial number and we knew it was ours. And that, that so, sounds like a USART team right there. Yeah. It just got, you know, it got set over to the side and, and left. And then um, somebody came along, picked it up and put it on the shelf. Like it was one of the department saws cause they had the same brand and everything, but we just happened to stumble across it, you know, <laughs> one day. So stuff like that. And I think out of the entire, out of the entire time, um, We've, we've lost one saw and we lost one thermal imaging camera for this was been 20 years ago for maybe a day and, and we were able to find it. So, um, but you got to have a system and you need to think, think about, so you're, if you've ever been on a hot site, you know, it's like, there's all this activity going on guy in a pickup truck pulls up and he's got two thermal imagers, a fire extinguisher and, you know, uh, a box of nails. Okay. He's got to know who to give that to. He can't just drop it off because if he just drops it off, it just becomes something sitting on the scene that nobody knows what it is. So he's got to go to that site supervisor, hand it to him, find out who he got it from radio back or either fill out the, the two thirteen or whatever yeah. we're, we're yeah. using them and, yeah. and have that documentation. I mean, two thirteens are like crazy. We got, yeah. we got them stacked up flying know. all over the place. They are, they are because yeah. they're telling you where to go and how to get back. And that's, that's what we use. We're trying to use some Google apps and Google forms and probably some barcoding and things like that to help, help with that. But, uh, it's, it's a lot. And, and we've made those mistakes by, okay, take it and take this to, 
Wayne Township's training center and drop it off. You drop it off. Then four hours later, you get a call. Hey, when are we going to get our so-and-so? You're like, oh, dude, it's been there four hours. Well, where is it? Oh, we're exactly. not sure. But it's like on it's, that It's on that 30-acre site somewhere. Let's find it. <laughs> it's like a chain of evidence. Yeah. And then we have to deliver lunches, too. I failed to mention that. Yeah. Food so unit. this is a pretty neat operation. Um, if you're familiar with the box lunches, and it's one of my favorite FDIC stories. So for years, if you went to hot and you knew um, one day you got cold fried chicken, and the next day you got a cold ham sandwich and then the sides may change, but you always got the, uh, the little Debbie Brownie and, uh, maybe a pear or an apple, a couple of pieces of candy, and then some baked beans or something like that. We would get torn up on the evaluations every year, cold fried chicken. Well in the South, that's like a delicacy, right? <laughs> so uh, people would complain about the cold fried chicken. So after 20 years, we decided, you know what? It's time for a change. Let's upgrade. We sampled 30 different things from the catering company. And we were like, okay, this is a marinated chicken sandwich. This is pretty good. And this other turkey club sandwich, this is pretty good. So we'll switch to that. So what happens on the evaluations? Where's the damn fried where's, where's chicken? The fried chicken? Our fried, fried chicken, chicken away. Chicken. Yeah. Lunches yeah. suck. You took our fried chicken away. So that's hilarious. But the lunch truck, yeah, it comes in a refrigerated truck and they're dropped off at logistics at nine o'clock in the morning. All right. That truck gets unloaded in about 15, 20 minutes and it's just pallets of lunches and drinks. Um, cause you got to remember we're, we're feeding like 3000 people. And so they come into the warehouse and they're divided up into the appropriate number. Um, and then they are loaded on trucks, vans, et cetera, and dispatched out. And the goal is to have them out by 10 o'clock so that the furthest away site, if it's an hour, has the lunches on site by 11. Um, if you're in a four-hour class, they hand you your lunch as you get on the bus and you eat on the way back. If you're an eight-hour class, you can kind of eat whenever you want to. But that's a that's a big operation. And that takes that takes about 20, 25 people working like their butts off for an hour to do that turnaround that fast. And uh, so far, we haven't had anybody not not miss out, you know, or not not get their lunch. So, Chief, you kind of uh, I remember talking with you this year. Um, you know, you, you kind of joke that this was the first opening ceremonies that you made. You know, and uh, I think that's tongue in cheek because, you know, you, you are, have been part of logistics and, uh, you know, your, your operations do continue into that day after the event, you know, and I guess that's kind of one of the things that, that uh, Chief Castros and I were talking about. You're, you're managing multiple operational periods. Uh, this is a planned event. You know, obviously you're, we all know that you're in the game the days before to prep and everything, but there, there is that carryover of a, of an entire operational plan just for demo. And I think that that gets overlooked on actual events, you know, so again, what better time than a planned event to actually come up with the true demo plan and accountability and, and making sure that what's leaving is in good shape. I know in having worked in California and in, in those large scale incidents and stuff, they really do want to make sure that the, that the equipment and the people that are leaving those uh, places are, are safe and okay and, and in good working condition. Uh, so uh, what does the, the demo process look like? Cause obviously all the students get to enjoy the, the hands on and then roll right into the conference. But uh, you know, what's the scope of that, that day of carryover of getting everything back together. So it's probably a week of carryover. Um, okay. The critical part is the following two days because of that turnaround of the equipment, getting back to places where it needs to be. And of course, the longer you wait, the harder it is for accountability. If you do lose something because people are leaving town and things are getting locked up and so forth. But, um, I learned probably the biggest lesson in logistics was demob starts the day the incident starts. So you are in a constant state of demob. And if you're not, you are going to spend days and days and days recovering. So um, our guys know that our site supervisors know that 
So there's a constant flow of equipment going and coming so that we're not waiting till the end to demo all the saws. If they only needed a saw for setup days, then on Monday we get that saw back. It gets clean, packed up and it's ready to go in case somebody else needs it or it's ready to go back. So there is somebody participating in some type of demo the entire time we're in operation. The true move into demo time though, does start, um, at, at about four, four thirty on Tuesday, the logistics crews are usually out until somewhere around six thirty seven. Um, and that is early because most of our training is at fixed facilities now. So we have the ability to secure equipment, but we, uh, when we were, when we were probably 80% acquired structures, we had to pick up everything Tuesday night. And so there were some nights where we wouldn't get done until 10, 11 o'clock. Um, with the fixed facilities, we plan it out so that if we can lock something up and pick it up the next morning, we can. And part of that is to get our guys to the, to the instructor dinner so they can actually, you know, get a little bit of a reward for all their, their hard work. But we will be all, of course, all the equipment's picked up. Um, things have to be shipped out of the warehouse. So that goes on. Ron Pierce stays until the following Tuesday. Um, after everybody's gone Saturday from FDIC or Friday, he stays till the following Tuesday. And we hope that all the shipping is done by then. Usually it is, but there, there might may be one or two things that we have to get out. And then Ted is still working. Um, cause they have to recover the warehouse and get everything inventoried, inventoried back in and, and have the warehouse, you know, back in order within like that following week. So yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. And the amount of hose, you just look at the amount of hose and stuff comes back dirty because there's no way to clean it. And so that gets done over the course of the year. Batteries got to be charged every couple of months and cycled through saws have to be cranked. Generators have to be cranked. So it's, it's ongoing all year round. And that's, that's why not many conferences have the, the hot like we have is because it takes a lot of resources to pull it off. It sounds you know? like, just like a user team with their cash. It's exactly. It's exactly it's like it. Same exact thing. That's a good crossover too. And, and that's another great uh, world of planned events and of maintenance and, and logistics is like 365, 24, seven. Nobody knows it. And all the operational folks come in with it. There's a deployment or a drill or something. But uh, we used to we used to uh, get in each other's grill, you know, about over two thirteens. And I don't have time for a two thirteen. It's like, oh, it's too bad. You're going to fill one out. You're not getting what you want, you know. Yep. And I'm so, glad that uh, I'm glad I got the opportunity to do logistics, being an operations guy, like at the department. Yeah. Because it just it just opened up such a, a whole nother world, and it's actually fun. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would say it's more fun on an incident, like a big incident working in logistics than it is on a planned event, even though that's fun too, but in a disaster, you really get to show your resourcefulness and yes. uh, like in Katrina, you know, it's like you go, you know, you, you're breaking into a home Depot that's mostly destroyed and just taking whatever you need because it's an emergency, but you're documenting it all so that yeah. you can reimburse Home Depot, yeah. um, you know, but it's kind of like, Hey, we need a, we need a big rubber tire loader. And what you want is you want like 35 MacGyvers on your logistics. Exactly. Team, Cause you exactly. want to drop them off at a public works that's been flooded and have them hot wire, whatever it is you need. And the yeah. thing is, it's fine to do that in that, in that time. But I mean, you know, you really need to break some guys out of prison and you do bring them yes. on your team and say, Hey, look, this is what we need. And, and, and you don't have to worry about getting in trouble. Just make sure that we document it so that we can, you know, pay the proper bills and, and get the equipment back to where it belongs. And, um, it's phenomenal. And, you know, Katrina, we did that with boats. We did it with loaders. We did it with lumber. Um, we did it with fire trucks. I mean, we did it with everything. <clears throat> Especially when we were a couple of weeks when we were in New York city, uh, it was the same thing. You know, it was, it was just a free for all, um, because, um, 
it was it was the same as what you're saying because you're looking at a uh, an infrastructure that's decimated and even though the city around us was intact the 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 square blocks that we were operating in were were might as well have been a hurricane you know uh, yeah. as far as you know the level of destruction so you're begging bro and stealing but then all of a sudden vendors started coming in and like you just said we're we're grabbing all this still stuff here and freaking hilti this and freaking you know husky that and whatever and we're filling out 213s as we're going and one of the you know the, the one of there's a few key rules and logistics number one is you don't ask for permission you ask for forgiveness because if exactly. you're waiting for permission you'll never get anything done exactly number two um always always walk around with a purpose like you're like you're supposed to be where you are and always have an important looking piece of paper in your hand and you can go anywhere you want the the, NIM, uh, the nims form 100 it's right form 100 <laughs> exactly yep. yeah it's Absolutely. like the, it's like the guide 11 in the uh guide 111 in the in the erg it's just yep. the, so, the guy but, that taught my uh type three logistics chief class he he had a saying that i'm, I'm sure he got from somebody but uh he said if logistics was easy they'd call it operations <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly yeah there's definitely a, there's a, you know the best logistics folks are operational folks they are they understand yeah. what's needed because they do it but they have a different mindset than your average ops person in the sense that they understand what's needed they, they do the operation they understand the intricacies and the little nuances of what is needed on that pile or out in the field, whether it's okay, well, they're gonna need this for the they're gonna need bar oil, they're gonna need this kind of chain, they're gonna need this. Right. And you don't just know that from memorizing, you know that from having done the job itself. Yeah. And then and then you go behind the scenes and you you kind of go into this place where you're like, it's like Chris, it's like Santa's workshop. You got all this cool stuff around you, and part of you wants to just open everything up and play with it, but you know you can't. You just gotta get it out to the to the knuckleheads that have no idea how hard you're working. Yeah. And 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 then who follow none of the rules and do not don't fill out any of the forms that you want them to because they just want to go out and and play. So there's a different there's there's I think to be a good logs person you have to first be a good ops person. Yeah, and I think I it, it really it really brings a well-rounded logistics person to the. And table. for FDIC, I was an instructor first. Yeah. In in the hot system, and then moved into the logistics. So you know you know what it's like to be on the other end of it. So like you said, it's yeah. almost like the, they use AI for everything now, but I mean, like you said, if a guy asks for a generator and that's all he asks for, you know, you he can needs way more than that. He's going to need all the things that go he with needs that a generator. funnel. He needs fuel. He needs oil. He needs yep. cords. He needs adapters. He needs any stuff. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. even know he needs. Right. And if he needs yeah. a saw, then he needs several different spare blades and he needs mix and he needs yeah. tools to work on it. And exactly. Yep, you're right. You're right, and that's that's what. And what's fun is you, you kind of geek out with your your fellow logistics guys. are kind of the same. They're all a bunch of goofballs and geeks. They geek out, um, and, and and they're the ones that make the fire department run too. You know, a lot of the times yeah. back at home. You know, and yep. and uh, it's uh, but the but the ancillary, like you were saying, the ancillary benefit of of learning the incident command system on such a deeper level. Um, I was I was blessed to be on a, a Type One team for four years. Oh my God. And I was just in logistics, you know, I just, I was just facilities. Oh my God. You know, walking around, walking around when everyone's out doing their thing and just talking to every little person in that whole system, all the finance people. Oh, so you're the check-in person or you're the, you know, mm -hmm. every little seeing expanded dispatch, you know, just every little thing you could possibly imagine. And then it goes, okay, now when I read a fog manual, I know exactly what I'm looking at. And also, when I'm an IC, I know exactly what my resources are around me at all times that I could tap into. And I'm thinking about, like you said, you're thinking about like a good IC, I think, before they get to the incident, they're already thinking about what they need. And when they're mm -hmm. before, once they're there, they're already thinking about what they don't need. <laughs> and right. so it's almost like you're able to think into a different uh, time, time frame ahead and behind and around you. Um, in a way that that makes your just general thinking more global and exponential than than the unifocal nature of oh you know Mongo wants to cut the hole Mongo needs saw okay well yeah. be more than that Mongo you can need something it's other. totally totally different than commanding a structured fire yeah it's a whole nother level and you can be a great uh, incident commander at a structured fire that's going to last an hour two hours maybe even three or four hours 
But when you get to that next level of command, it is just so different because you have to sustain it for a long time. And, and, uh, you know, that's when you, you're not just thinking about searching a building, ventilating it and, uh, and then picking up your hose and getting back in service. You're thinking about how are you going to rotate crews? How are you going to feed crews? How are you going to, um, get equipment in that you need and travel routes? Yeah. You got to be looking Food, so shelter, hard. lighting. Yeah. All of it. You know, yeah. you said something that brought up a, a thing. Uh, expanded dispatch is probably one of the most underutilized special event um, pieces uh, and uh, brag on my old department, um, Atlanta, they have the Peachtree road race and, and they don't call it that, but they have basically the race becomes an incident within the city. And so what happens when these special events is uh, a runner goes down at such and such a street, well, you start getting 911 calls and they go into the regular system. And there is a, a, a possibility that you're going to dispatch a unit to respond to that location and they're not going to be able to get there. So the dispatcher has to realize that that is related to the race and on the race route and has to pass that call to the dispatch for the race to dispatch the race resources. And it works beautifully if it's set up correct. So that expanded dispatch is, is critical. That gets overlooked. The dispatchers get overlooked a lot. I saw, they they do. I saw somebody really give the dispatchers a a big uh, um, shout out the other day for the uh, shooting that happened in, um, in Atlanta. And uh, they, they received like 3000 calls in in an hour. Yeah. And it overwhelms the system. And so they have to be able to narrow that down and communicate. But planned events, man, that is the time to learn it and practice well, it and get it down. You don't have, you have all the time in the world and compared to a fire and you have, uh, you have a lot more resources typically, and you have uh, really no, typically unless something weird really happens. You don't have a life threat, obviously that you're going to have. So you can really dive into it and just learn how to take everything you've learned and then compress it into the into the into a structure fire or a type four or five event um, mm-hmm. where the principles are the same, but the timing. Um, yes. And then and, and so that's where you start thinking, okay, I need to I need to I need to develop relationships because that's gonna grease the skids. You know, you on an incident, you you develop relationships over time on a on a like a on a nine eleven or a Katrina. Um, but the relationships you have at dispatch on just day to day work in your shift and your battalion relationships you have with dispatch, the relationships you have with law enforcement, the low race tips you have with, with, uh, um, uh, CHP in my case, you know, high patrol mm-hmm. we worked with a lot, um, park rangers, uh, you know, city officials, and just having those relationships that you're, that you're always kind of just kind of maintaining, you know, just making sure that you're getting some face time when you can, pays huge dividends when, when, uh, things are going sideways. Cause they're, they are invested in, in the success of your incident and, yep. and they're going to, they're going to tell you, Hey chief, did you think of this? Hey, did you, what about, do you want one of those? Hey, we went ahead and ordered this for you. It's like, Oh crap. Thanks. You know, I'll tell you one thing that I definitely applied from the planned event side and learning all that to real incidents was, um, if you want something done, um, as simple as maybe you're going to a second alarm and you want those units to stage somewhere, well, don't call them until you know where you want to send them. All right. And then designate who that staging area manager is going to be. Because we would, we would just call the units to staging. All right. So then they would just go and they were self-supervised. Um, so you have to designate if you don't have a chief officer to put there, at least designate one of the companies to assume that, that role. And I learned that very early is that if you want something done and you want it to make sure that it's, there's accountability, you have to assign somebody to that function. Um, nothing worse than having a policy that says your mutual aid companies have to check in, but you don't have anybody assigned to check them in. 
Right. So you have to have a check-in person and you have to have a designated uh, parking lot or, or facility for them to report to, to check in. Yeah. And, uh, um, you see that a lot, especially on, you know, real time operations is you don't have enough chief officers to come in fast to staff all the positions you need. So you have to use the company officers in, in some of those roles initially, initially. And that's why it's so important to cross train them. You know, the yes. more, the more like one of our philosophies at Metro was, Hey, let's get as many of our company officers and members onto these overhead teams or just as a single resource name request, um, you know, base camp manager, just something to get them out there so yep. they can be exposed and start thinking in these terms and always thinking about the pieces and the moving parts around them. And to your point, you know, always being modular. It's like building Legos. Okay, well, I, I'm going to build this over here called staging. Well, I need somebody in charge of that. I can't just have it out there. It's not going to manage itself. I need, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up a division. Well, I needed a supervisor. And that guy needs to know what that role entails. You know, you can't just yep. make a division. And, and you, then, you're you able to see what you're able to pull off with the resources. And uh, one of the one of the things I remember in the, in the training was uh, some of the some of the structure fire operational people doing scenarios and training and the guy we had a guy that was i think it was the logistics class and he was an operations guy and so he set up he was in charge of communications and whatever this incident was you know in disaster city you know whatever one of those little scenarios was and he had this thing divided into like 12 different tack channels and of course it was a forestry guy that was teaching the logs class and he goes what the hell my <laughs> god well channels he goes you're only managing like 36 people he goes we can manage a hundred and forty thousand acre wildfire with three channels <laughs> exactly and if we didn't have aircraft we could do it with two <laughs> <laughs> exactly and so uh, you know and you remember remember that phase we went through where it's like all right, if you have a firefighter go down, then you have like the root channel. switch to this yeah. channel and we have a tack yeah. channel for this. And it's like, all that does is add confusion. That's all it does. System. You know, if you want somebody to move channels, don't move the ones that are the most critical, move the other right. ones somewhere. Right. Like you're staging and those. Yeah. People. It was uh, funny um, that San Francisco fire department had, had a mayday and, and the chief in charge, the IC, dispatch goes would you like another channel like i'm gonna i want to help and he goes are you crazy <laughs> that's gonna only make it 10 times worse i you know yeah that let's was that half, let's, let's cut half the units off of our communication yeah exactly so, so uh, you know go ahead bray yeah I, I mean i hate to interrupt you you guys but uh i do want oh, to are go you back. are you with us I yeah. you were there. <laughs> the uh you know your your niosh 5 and policies and procedures and how to be you know proactive with the niosh 5 you're talking about staging and, and company officers and these types of things, but it, it does remind me, I was a, I was a two year firefighter on the ambulance um, at West Metro and we're throwing the, you know, pram in the back you, of the ambulance. Could you, could the you say that one more night. time? What's that? Could you say that one more time just for the audience? Yes, I, I was a two year firefighter, firefighter on, on, on the ambulance. On the ambulance. So what are and, those? Uh, we're clearing the hospital and, and we hear the, I see of this apartment fire call for a second alarm. And we're like, sweet, man, because you guys know ambulances are faster than any other rig in the city. So we take off flying over there and uh, it was a, a rude awakening because by department policy, first unit into staging needed to contact IC and assume the role of staging officers. So uh, we're the first ones there. Hey, command, this is medic one. We're, we're into staging. He's like, great, medic one, you'll be staging blah, blah, blah. But it really was just simple by policy. All I was, was the point of contact for that site, yeah. you know? So as the engines came in, the, the truck came in, everybody coming in, the IC would just say, Hey, I need one more engine up here. And then I would go face to face with whoever it was and send them up. And then the next would be, I don't need a rig, but I need a crew. So then yeah. I would just, you know, face to face with them, take it off the radio. So um, if you have a good plan, you have a good process and you've, you've practiced it, uh, e even your your 22 year old uh, ambulance guy can be a pretty effective staging manager because you just need that point of contact and that that face to face. I, as you would say, Chief, you know that hands on eyes on accountability um, yeah. of 
I'm giving you this rig. So now I'm short a truck company in staging. I could go straight on the phone call to dispatch to say, Hey, send me one more truck. Uh, so it just really kind of cleans things up. Yep. And it takes so much off of the decision maker who's watching the incident and having to make really critical decisions. It's like, they don't need to know like how many are over there or, or that you're backfilling. They just need to know when they call that you're going to send them a resource and you're going to, you're going to tell that command aid, the command technician or whoever's doing the documentation, Hey, staging, um, sending you ladder 20, 28 yeah. and, and here they come. And then you're going to mark them off your board and you're going to be listening and you're going to be like, like you said, you're not, not taking up a radio channel. You're calling dispatch and saying, Hey, can we get another truck to staging to, to backfill? So yeah. it's huge. And that's, that's how I, that's why I, that's the beauty of ICS is everybody says, you know, it, it, it has to expand with the problem and uh and it's position specific not rank specific and exactly. that's yeah. that's always a hard one to swallow <laughs> that that can be a hard one in the old school <laughs> systems old school departments they yes. do not they don't i like got it. a medic telling me what yeah, unit's yeah. coming yeah. up to my scene yeah, what yeah. The at the same time it's a it's a it's a in that setting it would it would have been a waste of resource to have a company officer and and commit a, a an engine company there you know it was just yeah. not that type of you know, on the flip side, it on an MCI or something, you know, it would be terrible to have an ambulance tied up doing that. You know, you just right. have to recognize right. what what the right setup for the right scenario is. And then, since we're getting low on time, Chief, I you know, obviously the planned events are what they are. But uh, can you speak to some of the contingency planning or uh, incident within an incident that you've handled? I mean, I'm sure FDIC, you're you're doing this planning year round, but you can't control weather impacts. You can't control uh, uh, bus breakdowns or or injuries and these types of things. I mean, what type of curveballs have, have popped up and, and what type of, uh, you know, we obviously know the medic planning, but what other types of contingency plannings, be it, be it weather or uh, apparatus support or anything like that, are, are in play? Um, so there's always an extra bus on standby um, to take off and, grab the students off of a bus and get them to the site. It's happened a time or two over the 25 years. Um, that's probably one of the, one of the biggest ones that we have standby and, um, probably the most unique one. I, I want to say this was, I want to say this was in Sacramento. Um, Castro's was, uh, the guys went out to do the prep on the collapse house when O'Connell was actually collapsing houses and they had to cut uh, a tree avenue they had to cut a tree down and the I was tree, there the tree actually <laughs> went into the house and <laughs> when you're doing a collapse class you want to collapse it controlled so you have certain areas and so the tree took out the uh, collapse house and i i think we were able to use it in a different structure if i remember correctly. i think if, if that was off of fulton avenue i think it was uh yeah because i remember being it was like a Remember we had a two-story garden apartment building and then there was a house or so I remember this big palm tree. And I, yep. I do yep. seem to remember that. <laughs> it was like, whoops. Yeah. Well, if um, anything was going to go wrong, it was going to go wrong in Sacramento. That's for yep. damn sure. And then one of, uh, gosh, this has been, this was the first year that we used Scott breathing apparatus and hot. So I'm thinking it was probably around 2004 or five. And, uh, um, Jim Crawford, who did the, uh, RIT combat drills. And of course I'm very green. This is only like my second, third year in, in logistics. And, uh, he had not put breathing apparatus on his list Oops. and I didn't catch it. And, uh, so we divvied out all the breathing apparatus. They were all gone because we always have more more requests than we have resources for. So, you know, guys over here wanted 70. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get a call at about 720 that RIT didn't have any breathing apparatus. It was Monday morning. Students were oh. unloading off the bus. Oh, crap. They needed 70 air packs. And uh, Indianapolis had just switched to Scott from inner Spiro and our logistics base was at the Indy logistics base. 
and the old chief there, I believe it was chief Gregory was his name. He was like for, for you old timers. He was like the, uh, the mechanic on Baba black sheep that was just grumpy <laughs> as hell. But if you got to know him, he was really a good guy, but on the surface, he was just good. Red. Ah, red, yeah. red. Yep. Red. You fly, you college boys tearing up my planes. He was just like yeah. that. And so he heard the radio traffic and he looked at me and I looked at him and I said, any chance you got any air packs laying around? And he goes, I got 450 air packs across the street. So we run over across the street with carts and we are counting out air packs and loading them. And they were there before eight o'clock in the morning. And the, they had to have the students <laughs> put the bottles on them and go, but the class never missed a beat. Never and knew the difference. 40 minutes prior to class starting was when that's we logistics, baby. Air, air that's packs. logistics. You know what they um, say? Paramedics save lives. EMTs save paramedics. Well, guess who right. saves everybody else? Logistics. Logistic. Yeah, it's it's true. Um, that's awesome. So that we got those contingencies. Obviously, um, the medical staff. We have the you know an ER doc that's out there with them. So we're able to do minor stitching and things like that without having to go to the hospital and disrupting class. Get you back in class. Almost like athletic trainers in a way. Try to keep you in the class as as best we can. Um, I would say after the first four or five years, the lessons that we learned prevented a lot of other things. And so you're, you're building contingencies as you build experience for, for sure. What's the, what's the succession planning? Like, you know, we talk about trainees and in, in the, in ICS and stuff for like red carding and whatnot. What's yep. the, what's the, is there, is there an intentional succession plan? Like does Ron Pierce have somebody that's younger than him, say maybe 80 years old, that's yeah. learning the ropes? Yeah. So uh, we started several years back. Um, obviously you don't think the, the younger you are, the less you think about it, but we started several years back and we wanted to be too deep on every position. And once we got there, we wanted to start, you know, bringing somebody else in. So, yep. Even Ron Pierce with his shipping and receiving, um, and what you find is the more organized you are and the more efficient you are, the more time you have that you're not putting out spot fires that you can actually sit down and do some training and Mentor let people shadow. Bit. Yep. And so, um, Brent Hollander who took over the logistics chief role had been doing transportation and communication along with me. And he, in one year has already, he's a hell of a lot more technical, like computer savvy than I am. And he's already, Google formed everything and he's got a plan for the take, and he's got a plan to take it to the next level. And he'll, you know, he's like, man, I inherited a great system, but I have some skills that'll actually make it even easier and more efficient for us. So, uh, That's awesome. um, we had a new, um, new twist this year in that the instructors came in a day later than normal. Um, and so we pre delivered equipment you, instead of having the instructors come check equipment out and check it and, and then deliver it. And, uh, it was scary because it was new, but it worked flawlessly. So Great. just that in itself saved the instructors a half a day of having yeah. to come to That's logistics great. and windshield time. And also. Yep. That's fantastic. So like Brian said, we're getting short on time. How about we close with this? Um, planned events. We, t we start with an ash five. Let's end with an ash five, right? So planned events, and and even even a fire department operating um, day to day can have NIOSH five issues. Um, you could have you know they don't recognize risk in the organization. They don't recognize they don't have a good command structure, lousy communication, lousy accountability, whatever. Um, plan event wise, what do you what would be some examples of things you've seen whether it was FEIC or Katrina or somewhere else that you saw? You know what NIOSH five happens in planned events too. It may not be as catastrophic, but it it happens. Um, communications. Yeah. It's always communications. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's probably the biggest, that's yeah. probably the biggest. And then, um, because they're so spread out is, um, you know, not having, not having some of your normal systems in place because you're so spread out, maybe mm -hmm. that would happen on a, you know, structure fire. You're going to pile all in there really quick, but you could easily have some like two man crews out 
working by themselves, doing some things where they could get hurt. And, and, uh, and again, the keys communication, you know, having that thing divided out where you got a, a division supervisor or somebody to report back to and accountability. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you, you, you were usually, even though the first few days you're, you're working pretty feverishly just to get the people off the tops of the houses and, and that, um, once you get past that initial few days, then you do have to kind of make sure you rein it in and, and, and make sure you're getting a break. You know, you're doing, a yeah. rehab. you're not, you're not operating on adrenaline anymore after yeah. three or four so days. I guess you and, crash. Yeah. I yeah. guess that's kind of a, a good point that you're, you're bringing up is, you know, span of control is not just number of people reporting to somebody. It, you got to take into account the stress and the environment and, and maybe, that distance is something that impacts your span of control. If, if two to three people are a long ways away from you, your reflex time to respond to them is going to be that much slower. So that's a, it's an interesting takeaway there. Yep. For sure. Well, I think we've taken up enough of your time. You're a busy man. We appreciate you being with us tonight to discuss ICS, the planned event. And uh, again, no, no greater event than FDIC and coming fresh out of it. Thank you for sharing your lessons learned. Thank you for all you've done for us and for fire service and the safety IC was phenomenal. Thank you guys. And Brian, you killed it on your keynote on Thursday was awesome. You guys had great classes. Um, valuations were great. And, uh, like I said, we're already working on 2024. If you, uh, want to put in a proposal, they are open and you go to the FDIC website and the call for presentations is open until June 23rd. So, Get it in. Hi, right, Chief. I got one little plug. Uh, something very exciting is coming from ULFSRI tomorrow. So uh, please right. please be on alert for that and, and plan to dedicate some time to uh, to, to receiving some, some great information uh, put out by UL, ULFSRI tomorrow um, as we continue to, to head in the right direction as an informed fire service and, and with a, a citizen focus. I read uh, one of the Facebook comments. I can't remember who it was after FDIC said uh, there was definitely a search theme going on <laughs> at FDIC. Yeah, maybe continue and I, tomorrow. I, I think I responded. Uh, it was not by chance. Look at the cover <laughs> of the magazine. Look at the editorial. Look at the keynote. Look at Brian Brush. <laughs> Just uh, yeah, it was very intentional and and uh, it was very much needed. Long overdue. Yes. Yeah. Amen to that. Well, thanks everybody for watching and listening. God bless you. God bless the American Fire Service. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.